material for present and future researchers. This event is also co-sponsored by the NYU Center for Multicultural Education and Programs, NYU Program in American Studies, and the NYU Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. And uh, in, in, in the course of their programming, their dynamic, exciting programming, which if you're not already on the newsletter, the email list you should check out, especially since they work with so many different organizations on, on campus, um, is, is uh, the reason why we're here today, which is, is really exciting. Uh, my name is Reka, a.k.a. DJ Reka. I was actually an artist in residence here in 2006 and 2007. Um, I'm currently teaching full-time uh, at the Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music uh, at NYU Tisch. I'm a DJ educator and activist, and I do a monthly uh, club night here called Basement Bangra around the corner uh, at El, uh, La Poisson Rouge. But to get it started here, to set up the conversation, um, you know, sometimes you say yes, and then you say, okay, what do I really have to do? Um, so I said, sure. And then I, I looked at what I had to do, and I re-familiarized myself with the work of our two speakers today. And I was like, oh my god, introduce this topic. That, that's, it's a bit daunting. Um, and I think that's the point of it, that it is a bit daunting. Um, and uh, both, our, both our presenters have very uh, different styles and methods, um, but they're powerful in the way they speak about it. So the idea of post-race is really one of the touchstones of this conversation. So, um, you know, we talk a lot now about millennials, the younger folks, from my vantage point. Um, and I just want to uh, uh, quote a few things from, from that generation called the millennials. In a report uh, by ARC, Applied Research Center, in the 2011 report interviewing activists, uh, the report called, uh, Don't Call Them Post-Racial. Um, and this idea that we are living in a post-racial America, and that we are equal and we don't have to talk about it anymore, said Elena, a uh, 25-year-old Latina activist. Um, we, we do talk about it, but a lot of people shut down. Simon, a 25-year-old Latino Occupy Wall Street participant, agreed that when talking to the media, people just shut down when you mention race. It is a barrier to getting the message across. Other people's ignorance is a barrier. It's just hard because people's <laughs> ignorance makes them shut down and not seeing where you come from. Henry, a 28-year-old Korean-American community organizer in Portland, argued a bit more broadly that people just don't want to talk about race in general around the country and around the world because it makes people well, we're going to talk about it tonight. Um, and we're going to continue to talk about it. Just before I got on, I was talking with Jeff, and we're talking about how do you know when something's finished? A book, a mix, whatever. And uh, the truth is, it's never finished. So this conversation, hopefully, is just a good thing. So with this, I, I introduce Jeff Chang. Jeff Chang is the executive director of the Institute of, for Diversity in the arts and community on the black performing arts at Stanford University. Named, the Utney Reader, named by the Utney Reader as one of the 50 visionaries who are changing your world, Jeff Chang has been a USA Ford Fellow in Literature and a winner of the North Star News Prize. His first and most excellent book, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, garnered many honors including the American Book Award and the Asian American Literary Award. He was the editor of Total Chaos, The Art and Aesthetics of Hip Hop. His current projects include Three new books, Who Will Be, The Colorization of America, forthcoming 2000, uh, this year at St. Martin's Press, Youth, uh, uh, Picador Big Ideas Small Book Series, and a biography of Bruce Lee, on, in, uh, published by Little Brown. He was a founding editor of Color Lines Magazine and co-founder, co-founding member of Soul Sides Hip Hop Collective, now Quantum Project. Born of Chinese and Native Hawaiian ancestry, Jeff was raised in Hawaii, and now lives in Berkeley, and he is also an Aries. Kia Se Lehman was born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi. Lehman attended Millsaps College and Jackson State University before graduating from Oberlin College. 
He earned an MFA in Indiana University and is the author of the forthcoming novel, Long Division, uh, due June 11, 2013, uh, and a collection of autobi autobiographical essays. How to slow, uh, and a collection of autobiographical essays, How to Slowly Kill Yourself and Others in America, due out in August 2013. That's pretty cool, two books in, in the summer. Um, as well as a contributing editor at Gawker.com and a column, columnist at ESPN.com. He has written essays and stories for Esquire, ESPN, Gawker, Longman's Hip Hop Reader, NPR, Mythium, Politics and Culture. Lehman is currently an associate professor of English creative writing and co-director of Africana Studies at ASA. So let's get started with Jeff. And uh, I really want to thank the Asian Pacific American Institute here at NYU. I've been privileged to be able to uh, be a part of the programming that APA Institute has been doing for quite a while now. I don't want to say how many years, but um, uh, it's always uh, an amazing place. I got my master's degree from the UCLA Asian American Studies program, and I feel like uh, in a lot of ways NYU APA Institute is, is kindred. In a lot of ways. So coming here is like coming home. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, uh, and I thank you so much to Amita for pulling this together. We can give her a hat, right? Where is she? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really want to. I, I mean, uh, it's it's a beautiful thing. Even though Amita went to to Punahou, um, which is okay. Um, I, I, I'm so grateful for for, uh, for pulling this event together because I'm just I'm just in awe of Kese. Um, I'm just I'm about to stand myself here, but he's this is just amazing and his books, uh, which I've had the opportunity to be able to to read now, uh, they're they're the real deal. Uh, they will change a lot of 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 the ways that we we um, understand narrative about race at this particular point in, in our history, and I feel like uh, being able to be here tonight and speaking with him is a, is a real big deal for me. So thank you, Amita. Thank you, KSA. Okay. Um, I'm going to do uh, a, a little bit of a reading here from uh, the book that I have coming out called Who We Be, The Colorization of America. And it's not really representative of what the book uh, is about. This is sort of the introduction. It's, it's sort of conceptual. Uh, the book is very narrative. Um, it's about trying to understand the way that we see race now uh, and the way that it's changed and hasn't changed over the last five decades. Um, so it starts in 1963 and it goes all the way up to, to right this moment. Um, literally right this moment because I'm still working on it. <laughs> and, uh, my editor hasn't cleaned it back yet, so I'm still going to be writing until she comes and cries out of my hands. Um, so this is a, a work in progress, and uh, uh, I'll start. Uh, it's called Seeing America, Introduction, Seeing America. For most of 2008, the most arresting image in America was a screen print by the street artist Shepard Ferry that appeared on posters, stickers, and clothing from sea to shining sea. The image was of a black and white man rendered in red, white, and blue. The man was named Barack Obama, and the four-letter word below his image was hope. Obama was, of course, the presidential candidate who had come from the far geographic and cultural edge of the United States, its Pacific borderland in Hawaii, to secure the Democratic Party nomination. He had run on a platform of mending a divided country. In a speech in March that he called a more perfect union, he offered his own biracial heritage, the unity of black, capital B, black and white histories in his own body as a symbol of empathy and reconciliation. That address, now popularly known as the race speech, was in some ways as historic as Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech delivered at the Lincoln Memorial almost 45 years earlier. The complexities of race that we've never really worked through, Obama said, remain a part of our union that we have yet to perfect. If Americans could move forward on race, he seemed to say, they could move forward on anything. For much of the U.S. first 200 years, it was a country defined predominantly by whiteness, drawn in grays, 
shades of white and black, not capital B black. But in fairy's print, Obama had been colorized, to coin a phrase, just as the country two and four, which he had become a symbol, a symbol, excuse me, had been colorized. Colorization describes those massive shifts that began taking place in the 1970s after the ebbing of the civil rights movement. These shifts have first been demographic, and more recently they've had political implications. But in between, and most thoroughly, they've been cultural. One in three Americans is now of color. They form the majority in a third of the country's most populous counties, and in forerunner states like California, Texas, New Mexico, and Hawaii. Demographers have become accustomed to naming each new cohort of youths, quote, the most diverse generation this nation has ever seen. Sometime before 2050, perhaps as early as 2042, the U.S. is expected to become, quote, unquote, majority minority, a term that seems stranger with each new set of census data. If no race is a majority, then everyone's a minority. This shift has had political consequences, too. In 2000, voters of color made up only 19% of the electorate, but in 2004, more than half of all new voters between the ages of 18 and 29 were black or Latino. In 2008, youth and voters of color turned out in record numbers, forming the foundation of the electorate that put Obama into office, and by 2012, more than a quarter of voters were of color. But what exactly have these changes meant culturally? This is what the U.S. has been trying to work out for the last 40 years, maybe 200 years, and what the nation may be working on for many, many more. Most of us will agree that race is not a biological question. Instead, it is a question of culture, and it begins as a visual problem, one of vision and visuality. Race happens in the gap between appearance and the perception of difference. It is about what we see and what we think we see and what we think about when we see. In that sense, it's about much more than personal affinities, preferences, tastes, and bonds. Ralph Ellison encapsulated the central problem of race and American vision and visuality in 1952. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me, his protagonist remarked in the famous prologue to Invisible Man. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings themselves are figments of their imagination, indeed, everything and anything but me. Difference is human. And noticing difference is human, it begins for us as babies from our very earliest days of perception. But of course, Ellison was pointing out that America's race problem came from something far deeper. For whites, historically, skin tone and physiognomy not only signaled difference, they signaled inferiority. This was the way that racial power worked. It went further than merely perceiving difference, it sorted difference into vast systems of freedom and slavery, commitment and neglect, investment and abandonment, mobility and containment. Then, it drew a veil over these systems and pretended not to have even seen difference in the first place. Racism, in other words, was supported by a specific kind of refusal, a denial of the possibility of empathy, a mass-willed blindness. In this context, the other's true self would always remain unseen. The musician and intellectual Vijay Iyer has compared seeing to listening. When we feel empathy for another person, our brain's mirror neurons fire, telling us to feel the way that they feel. We literally understand another's pain or joy at the root level of our being. Art or music or literature may move us in the same way. But studies have shown, Iron notes, perceptions of racialized difference get in the way of empathy. Between a baby's curiosity about difference and an adult's perception of difference, something has changed. We have learned to be compassionate or fearful before what we see. What made the last great consensus for racial justice possible? Here, Iyer speculates on the history of race, visuality, and popular music in the last half of the 20th century. This is where I'm trying to bridge, can't stop, won't stop with who we be. Vijay Iyer asks, is it possible that music heard and not seen which, of course, was scarcely possible before the advent of recorded music, might have overridden the visual, racialized, culturally imposed constraints on empathy. Could the essential humanity of African Americans been newly revealed for white American listeners in the 20th century through the disembodied circulation of quote-unquote race records? 
by activating in these listeners a neural understanding of the actions of African American performers? Could a new kind of cross racial empathy, or at least a new quasi utopic racial imaginary, have been inaugurated through the introduction of recorded sound? Listening, I suggest, may have been central in the making of the last great consensus for racial justice. The sonicality of race, powerfully shaped by 20th century black music, literally firing the national conscience. But after the civil rights movement, race became a new kind of American problem. The visuality of race, in all of its national history of erasure and debasement, became increasingly important simply because people of color would no longer remain invisible. With energy and urgency, artists and activists of color began to address the consequences of invisibility, the absence of representation, and the presence of misrepresentation. And so the new formal conditions of legal desegregation gave rise to a movement of art and ideas meant to bring about cultural desegregation. Its proponents came to name it multiculturalism. But as the ideas of the movement moved from its avant-garde uh, origins into art, into higher education, and then into the mainstream, it encountered powerful resistance, and thus began the era of what the conservative Pat Buchanan named the culture wars. These wars erupted in the last epoch of the 20th century because the multiculturalism movement and massive, dem massive demographic change prompted new discussions about democracy, particularly around the values of expression, recognition, inclusion, and empathy. Both sides in the culture wars understood and still understand that battles over culture are high stakes battles with important consequences. The struggle between retrenchment and change begins in culture. Culture is where change can be thwarted before it begins. It's also where change can be incubated. Politicals, pollsters, and pundits, those who believe in a science of change, fixate on the question of what is politically possible. But in any society, perhaps the more revealing and more productive question is the one asked of all of those who believe in the art of change. What is culturally possible? Thanks very much.
and I was lucky enough to be able to read, uh, read, to read who we be over the last two or three weeks, and the same thing is gonna happen. The same thing's gonna happen. This shit is about to change everything and make a lot of these people look like the hacks they are. So I'm really, <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy that I'm getting to share some space and time um, with Jeff. Uh, okay, so I have this novel coming out August 13th, uh, June 11th, called Long Division. Um, hopefully I'll go check that out. Uh, and I have another book coming out in August called How to Slowly Kill Yourselves and Others. And what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to read the introduction, uh, the prologue to that essay book. Um, we're calling it an essay book, but really it is shaped like an album of 13 or 14 uh, tracks and a few interludes. And, and, and what I'm going to read is just the beginning. And it's a letter to my uncle. And I think we should think about it, you know, letter in this so-called post-race era, written from uh, one black man slash boy uh, to his uncle. Um, and then we'll get it in. Thank y'all for coming. Thank my students, too, that I've taught. I'm, I'm happy to see y'all. can't believe y'all came out. I um, appreciate it. All right. It's called We Will Never Know. Dear Uncle Jimmy, as a black boy growing up in Mississippi, I learned that there was a rickety bridge between the right and the wrong. And I learned that I would be disciplined more harshly than white boys for even leaning toward the wrong side. But like you, Uncle Jimmy, I sadly didn't give a fuck. I broke bets I made with myself. I got kicked out of high school a number of times. I was suspended from college and I had run-ins with police that broke mom and grandma's heart. Unlike you, though, I did all of this in close proximity to a lanky, living, and breathing warning. Uncle Jimmy, that warning was you. On July 4th, you threw down your crack pipe, scrubbed yourself clean, and bought grandmama some meat. This mama's meat, you wrote in loopy black letters on a bloody paper sack. When your sister, my mama, called me in my office at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York, she had no idea that the 4th of July would be the last day she would see you alive. You joked with your sisters before taking a little tray to get more bottle rockets. Reeking of that familiar mix of sour scalp and Jordan cologne, you probably blinked those huge webbed eyes more than usual and actually asked questions of our family. As with many of Mama's stories, you weren't the star. But you were the precocious, paroled man on whom our family emotional stability really rested. There was a terrible clarity in Mama's voice when she told me the story of July 4th. Mama's voice sounded like this any time you followed a crack binge or run in with the police with something graceful, like leading a Sunday school session or using your pension to buy that house over off Highway 35. You driving my mama crazy, Aunt Sue said, over 20 years ago, the night I drove mama to her first nervous breakdown. You headed down the same road as Jimmy. I learned that night that the Uncle Jimmy Road ran adjacent to the refined, curved avenues that nearly all sisters, aunts, mamas, and grandmamas wanted their black boys to travel. Aunt Sue and mama wanted me to know without a doubt that whatever consumed you would eventually consume me unless I prayed diligently, obeyed the law, remained clean, and got out of Mississippi by any means necessary. But even as I sprinted away from Mississippi to Ohio, then Indiana, and now New York, if I looked down, I could never really distinguish your footprints from my own. That's what I felt before July 7th. On July 7th, three days after you towed in a bag of meat to Grandma's house, I got a call. Grandma was looking for you. She drove over to your house because you wouldn't answer the phone. Grandma opened the screen door and pounded on your door that evening. Grandma yelled your name over and over again, but you didn't answer. You couldn't. On July 12th, eight days after bringing Grandmama her meat, your sisters walked into Matt Funeral Home and readied your black body, the body of Grandma's first child and their only brother for public viewing. They made the funeral director change his shirt. Your sister Sue, the most mesmerizing preacher in Mississippi, eulogized you in Concord Baptist Church that day. We were all baptized there. At the core of Sue's elegy, eulogy uh, were three ideas. Number one, niggas do not exist. Number two, perfectly sanitized, wholly responsible black people do not exist. Number three, you, Jimmy Alexander, were equally wicked and wonderful. And we had far more in common with you than we wanted to admit. Sue made the church know that you lived a life of bad. Not bad meaning good or bad meaning evil, but bad meaning bad and being human. In traditional Old Testament style, she explored justice and recreated in you someone who had prepared themselves for death 
are finally accepted and earning life in the days before your passing. Sue told the church the story of, your bringing up, of you bringing the meat to grandmama's house. She told us how you wrote this mama's meat. She told us that you had gotten your finances in order. She said, Jimmy wasn't that different than nobody else in this church. No better, no worse. And that's what we have to accept. He was part of our family. He was our brother. While Sue stood in the pulpit teaching us about acceptance of our badness, I realized that you were the only child of grandma who did not become a teacher. If you taught for a living, you might not have been physically or emotionally healthier, since we all know that occupations are never shields from reckless sex, drug abuse, cowardice, deceptiveness, and desperation. But grandma would have found far more peace the day of your funeral if she knew that her oldest child, a paroled black boy born in the late 1940s, taught somebody, somewhere, something before he died. As grandma's youngest daughter gave the church words to lean on your mother, our teacher, the thickest, most present human being either, any of us have ever met, folded up at the end of the pew. Grandma cried herself breathless as your bloodless black body lay right over the site of your baptism 55 years earlier. I held Grandma without Uncle Jimmy. I held her just like she would have wanted you to hold her if I were stretched out in that casket. I needed you, Uncle Jimmy. I needed you the day of the funeral, and we were both alive. I needed you to be better than you were. But I never loved you enough to tell you. I could have shown you by calling you more or walking with you down Old Morton Road when I visited during the summer and Christmas. We could have wondered about the wide roads and the huge dying trees we both imagined fighting off Godzilla and King Kong in our childhood. We could have joked and tossed our running jazz back and forth as some nephews and uncles do. Then if we really tried, we could have harnessed the courage to knock each other's hustle. I could have finally said, Uncle Jimmy, you're drowning yourself with that crack and all that hate. That's what they want us to do. Ain't nothing really behind that smile, Uncle Jimmy. I love you, and I need you to live. And you could have told me there's more than one way to drown, nephew. You're looking pretty wet yourself. I know I'm under that water, but do you know where you at? Those words were never said. We talked, but we didn't reckon with each other. Hence, all of our communication created no echo, no meaningful reverberation outside of our speculations about each other. The last thing you said to me the Christmas before you died was, no matter how much right you try to do, white folks do everything they can to make a nigga remember they owned us. There was a silence after the sentence, and I feel that silence with a mechanical head nod and a weak, yeah, I hear that. By that point, though, I believed you. I assume you cope with the weight of being a paroled black man in Mississippi by laughing, acting a fool, relying on crack cocaine, alcohol, and the manipulation of women who were just as hopeless as you. And I assume that you know I coped with the parole life in many of the same ways you did. One of the only differences between you and me was that I fell deeply in love with the possibility of written and spoken words. I believed, as Jeff Chang writes, in words that free. I used those words to create stories, essays, novels I thought you'd want to read, hear, and see. When I wasn't writing things that you might have wanted or needed to read or hear and see, I created fictive versions of you that were sadly more interesting and more loving than I ever allowed you to be in real life. You inspired thousands of paragraphs, hundreds of scenes, but I never even showed you one sentence. I was afraid to know for sure that you thought my work was a hustle, a shiny, indulgent waste of time. But more than that, I didn't want you to know that I wanted you to be better at being human. I didn't want you to see that I saw in the real you someone I never wanted to be, a shiftless, paroled nigga, worthy of only hollow awe and rabid disgust. A smiling nigga who fought a few good rounds before getting his ass whooped, fight after fight after fight. I believe that you forfeited your right to be a beautiful black human being, Uncle Jimmy. And, I, and predictably, I knew that I would become you. I hated you and me for that. This is a shameful admission, a confession that is even more sour of indulging guilt when I acknowledge that all of the women in our family, in my writing, who were based off the of characters of our family, Mama, Grandmama, Aunt Sue, and Aunt Linda, are far less moving, far less round, and far less paradoxical than the actual women themselves. And this has less to do with my writing than it does with our love and understanding of these human beings and our love and understanding of each other. I love the black women in our family enough to ask them questions. They love me enough to answer those questions, often with questions of their own. Echo.
honestly, I don't know if I ever asked you any questions other than why you look so happy in your Vietnam pictures when I was 10, and why you said there's some fine bitches on earth that year you picked me up from graduate school. My recreating more interesting characters based off uh, of you to fit the specifications of a paragraph doesn't make me despicable. It makes me an American writer. Mm -hmm. What makes me despicable is that one of the responsibilities of American writers is to broaden the confines, sensibilities, and generative capacity of American lit by broadening the scope of whom we write. You can't really explore the terror and wonder of being born, as Baldwin says, captive in a supposed promised land if one never conceived the colorful cactus as a crucial critics, not simply, simply consumers and objects of your work. Anyway, only a fool doesn't actively regret. I wish we could have waited in the awkward acceptance that we are neither African nor conventionally American, neither subhuman nor superhuman, neither tragic nor comic, neither defeated nor victorious. I wish we could have affirmed our awareness that our blackness and our southernness are both perpetual burden and benefit, and our masculinity, a measurable part of us that must perpetually be reckoned with. Mostly, Uncle Jimmy, I wish you could have told me that we are fucked up, and much of the nation needs it that way. But we owe it to our teachers and our students to imagine new routes into unconventional beauty and healthy relationships and compassionate citizenry and imaginative inquiry. We owe it to each other to love and insist on meaningful American revision until the day that we die. That's what I needed to tell you when you were alive. That's what I needed you to tell me. That's what I need to believe. One night while revising long division, I thank God that you weren't my father. By feeling like the luckiest nephew in the world to call someone as tortured as you my uncle, I wondered who and what I really would have become without you as my warning. I wondered how your life would have been different if I would have told you I loved you. What would you have done differently with your life if you really believed me? What would we both have felt? Uncle Jimmy, no matter how I contort these words, we will never ever know. This book is a love letter written five years too late. I'm sorry I didn't love you, your nephew, Kiesa. Came from and where the concept came from, 
because there's, a, I mean, obviously there's a lot going on in the book, and we can talk a little bit about that. But where did the where did the idea come from, and where did the the concept come from, just for the title itself? Um, the the uh, the idea for Long Division. Well, Long Division is is a, is really a love story. It's a meta love story. It's a novel within a novel. Um, and there are two characters, there are a lot of characters in the novel, but there's one character at one point says, you know, I wish you would just get to the point. Everything with you is like long division. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wrote that line years ago, and initially I, I titled the book something else, something crazy corny. Um, <laughs> but it was precious, it was mine, so it was hot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was so good, because I thought of it. And, um, and then after a while, I was just like, man, Long Division keeps coming up in this in this book, uh, literally, and it keeps coming up, uh, uh, I think, some ways, like, definitely metaphysically. So I, I just thought it made sense t to uh, call the book Long Division. And the book that the characters find in Long Division is called Long Division. So, you know, I wanted the reader to feel like they were part of the narrative by reading the book with the, the characters. You know, so. But yeah, it seems to me like there's, what you're trying to do is to, get to uh, a narrative around race. race. Race in some ways is maybe the long division, yeah. the long division that we've had right. historically. And, and you have the characters doing this cool, like Octavia Butler, like time shifting yeah. and that kind of thing, going back and forth between 1964 and 1985 and yeah. 2013, right. um, and trying to sort of present the whole of history. But it's almost like, uh, it's almost like at this particular time in history, what well, we've been through now, I guess, you know, five years of a historic presidency. Right. And people told us everything was supposed to change. Mm -hmm. And it really hasn't in right. a lot of ways. In some right. ways it's gotten worse. Yeah. Um, that we're, we're struggling to try to think up maybe, I know I see it in your work, um, a new narrative, how, yeah. to, how to explain where we're at now, yeah. where we're supposed to be beyond this long division, but mm -hmm. clearly we're not, right? Right, I and mean, one of the things I was thinking about with the book is, um, and this is, I think this is wholly tied into what you're doing and who we be is, you know, imagine to that was like, what happens if the multiculturalist and the multicultural uh, uh, apparatus, you know, had to face these mostly black kids from 1985, 2013, and 1964? What would happen? And ultimately, I want to say that I hope that the kids would whip multiculturalism ass, right? Mm -hmm. But but I, I don't necessarily think that's true. One of the things I was thinking when I read Who We Be is, you, you say early on in the book that the multiculturalists won, mm -hmm. right? They multiculturalists won. So I'm really interested in what what we would look like, what discourse would look like, what po public policy would look like if the multiculturalists did not win. Mm -hmm. Probably 1964. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you mean by with the multiculturalists ass? Because that's kind of interesting to me. like. If the kids had gone back in time, they would have whipped the multicultural sass. Well, like, well I, I think, I, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't want to give away what I think the book actually does and say at the end, but okay. I, I think that the kids ultimately are, are, are scarred. Some of the kids don't make it. But, but, but what I'm hopefully saying in the book is that not just policy, but again, this, this, this kind of fluffy idea of multiculturalism can't win if we work with conviction and love and art, right, through the creation of, of, of alternative art. So what, what I hope people understand is they're reading the creation of alternative art. You, if multiculturalism had won, the Long Division wouldn't be published. Mm, you know what I'm right, saying? Right, and right. In, terms, in terms of meta. Right. And, yeah. and, 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 not, and not, you know, that's, yeah, we can talk about that a little bit more if you want. But, but again, this idea of multiculturalism winning, like you, I, I hadn't thought about it as explicitly until I, I read Who We Be. And again, you say the multicultural is one, and we see evidence of how they might have won. Um, but I'm interested, like, what, like, did they completely win? Did they really win? And you're like, yeah, they won. Well, no, I mean, actually, well, this is the whole thing about words like winning and victory and stuff, right? right? Is I mean, hip hop won, but did hip hop really win? You know what I mean? <laughs> it, it's, it's. I kind of feel the same way about multiculturalism that I feel about hip hop mm. in a lot of ways. And that, so the multiculturalists start calling themselves multiculturalists mm. in the mid-70s. This is um, after all of the identity movements, black power, you know, brown power, yellow power, red power. Um, and it's sort of the natural evolution of, uh, of what needs
needs to happen for a lot of folks. Um, moving from cultural nationalism into building coalitions or hearing folks across race, across gender, across identity. Um, and, and Ishmael Reed actually comes up with the term. Right. Ishmael Reed, the, you know, the, the great San Francisco, uh, open based author, yeah. um, who uh, wrote Mumbo Jumbo. Yeah. And uh, so in 1975, he starts talking about the rise of all of these authors that he's terming the multiculturalists. And this avant-garde starts forming around this notion, right? And you start seeing this happening in, uh, uh, amongst feminists of color. Um, you start seeing it happening amongst a lot of writers of color. Yardbird, mm -hmm. his journal, um, moves from being a predominantly you know, black arts journal to being something that invites in all of these writers from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, it's kind of radical to talk about this notion of multiculture because there's only like, if you're, if you're not a multiculturalist, if you're a Pat Buchanan, there's only one American culture. Right. We're all assimilating to it, right? We're all the frogs in the pot and they're turning up the heat and stuff. And that like, whiteness is what we're getting all melted towards, right? Yeah. Um, in this melting pot. So it's, it's like there's one culture, there's one American civilization, everything is unitary. So just the idea that there could be multi-cultures within America, that there had always been multi-cultures in America, um, was pretty radical at the time. So they have this, this movement that's really short-lived, and I think really by the early 90s, the backlash is set in. Um, and uh, multiculturalism has moved to becoming an educational sort of policy, a way of dealing with diversity, dealing with a lot of folks who are coming now to the universities. Mm -hmm. Uh, because there's all these bodies now, 1965 Immigration Act, and and uh, you know just the growth of diversity right. um, happening. Uh, all these students are coming into uh, schools and into higher education, and this becomes uh, a battle about you know uh, about about a battle in a way. It's a it's sort of a meta battle. It becomes um, something that can be boxed away as diversity, um, and so I think that that's really critical to know, just in the same way that hip hop started off as kids wanting to have fun, that there was something radical about it, and that this then, you know, becomes something that, that can put, get put on a record, right. right, and then it changes at that particular point, and at some point, uh, a lot of the teeth get pulled out, a mm -hmm. lot of the fangs get pulled out of hip hop, mm -hmm. um, as hip hop continues its commercialization. So, the book changes in the middle, because where you really see multiculturalism taking place is uh, within corporations right. uh, and within the state. We're trying to figure out ways to contain diversity more than anything else. Mm -hmm. So it's a win, yeah, it's a victory, but it's also kind of uh, a big uh, a big failure. Yeah. In you know, in, in the last chapter of the book, you uh, quote uh, Sullivan from the Atlantic, and, 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 and you quote him saying, Is there you? Here? Is there you? Um, but one of the things you say is that after after the election of Obama, Sullivan said that beyond anything else, this election is going to prove to be a truce for race relations. Right? Well, like, what a sucker thing to say. <laughs> but but he meant it, and thankfully he said it. And and so you know when I was reading that, I I, I thought a lot about um, this accidental racist song. <laughs> where uh, Brad Paisley did what he's supposed to do. Right? Uh, this is what we expect of Brad, everybody who listened to Brad Paisley, he did exactly what he's supposed to do. And LL Cool J kind of did. Right? What do you think LL Cool J should do? Uh, well, I, I, I'll, I'll get to what I think he should have <laughs> done. Ultimately, ultimately, like most things, I think it's a critique of New York, and I want to diss New York and in New York later. Um, but, 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 for, but for now, Wait, do you think it, it was Brad Paisley's critique of New York, or Ella Cuja? Or I, you know, I mean, okay. So one thing I really think about this song is that I think if you get the the wackest MC out there, right, the MC who you think is like the most ignorant MC from the South, you could get. And I don't think these cats are ignorant, but I think people think they're. You get Scrappy from Love and Hip Hop. You could get uh, Trinidad James. I think if you got them on record, they would have pushed back far more than LL Cool J, uh -huh. no question. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that pushback would have been because they represent a region that wouldn't have had it any other way. You have to push back if you're a Southern MC 
hearing white Southerners say the shit he said on that record. For some reason, New York, I guess, is cool with LL Cool J maybe saying what he said. That's what I want to try to, but I want to say that later, like near the end. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but, 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 of course you get to your punchline. Right. Really. But, but what Sorry. I really want to say is like, what do we make of LL Cool J's uh, rhyme? In some way being really in line with um, Obama's race speech, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like this conciliatory approach, black people need to get better, white folks need to get better. If we really push, we can get better together. I mean, LL Cool J, this must be a, might be a generous reading of it, but I think that's what he was trying to do, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, I'll forget this if you forget this, right. right? It's the truth. And we expect that from politicians, right? Even people who love Obama expect that from Obama. I, I don't understand why or how LL Cool J is allowed from his hometown to say what he said. Right. Well, I think there was a lot of pushback. I mean, I'm not trying to defend New York, because I'm from the West Coast. Right. <laughs> but um, I think there was a lot of pushback. I mean, it's interesting, too, that these are the two ad libs, right? This, right? this is after his verse. So he says, for those of you who haven't heard the song, he's, something, he's saying something like, I don't have the words correct necessarily, but uh, uh, if, if you forget my do-rag, I'll forget your red flag. And, but it's even uh, worse than that. Can I just say something? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, well, what's even worse is that it's, it's, it's call and response. If you listen to the song, he's doing it in call and response, right? right. Paisley has his line. Right. LL yeah. has his line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paisley has his line. LL has his line. Right. So, so, so literally, it's using not just a hip hop trope, but it's using a trope that's like rooted in black Southern tradition. That's right. And in that, using that trope, he's saying, I'm literally going to forget slavery. Right. If you can forget these fucking gold chains around the my chains, neck. And I'll forget the iron chains right. or something like that. Right. While Paisley singing about Southern Right. Queens. And there was pushback. Right. You're right. There, there has yeah. been pushback. I think there's been a lot of pushback. Um, but there's a but, though, right? No, there's a but. There's yeah. absolutely a but there. Um, I think, so two things. One is, is and this is what I love about, uh, about your book of essays, right? Um, your book of essays is, it's not just you. You know, in the, in the old traditional sense, uh, nonfiction essay books are written to really aggrandize, right. you know, people's uh, uh, ability to be like the big, great opinion makers, yes. you know. And, you know, that's sort of the, the, the thing that goes on. But in your book, it's multivocal, right? You, a lot of it is actually really old fashioned. You have letters that you're sending to friends. Friends are responding uh, to family members, to your mother. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's a really poignant, way to end the book actually is the dialogue that you're having with your mom. And I thought, for me, that's representing the point that we need to be at, which is actually having conversations, actually being brutally honest. What did you say, man? You had this beautiful thing um, about truth, you know, about we need, you just said it, we owe it to each other to love and insist on meaningful revision until the day that we die. And, mm -hmm. and, and to be able to, to do this um, in dialogue, mm -hmm. right, and to be really brutally honest with that. And we haven't had a real race dialogue mm -hmm. since Clinton had that thing back in 1997 right. saying we're about to have this race conversation, right. and then Monica Lindsay came along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of it's sort of interesting to me that they're having now this conversation that's, it's 200 years old. They're using language that's 200 years old, mm -hmm. right? He's talking about the point. South, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. And, and what the rebel flag means to him in terms of, of losing the Civil War. Right. Like, okay, what was the Civil War fought for again, Brad Paisley, history lesson? Right. Like, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and then, of course, L.L. was put in a position of, okay, if I need to respond to this, I can either go deep and remind him of that, or I just have to act like, you know, it's all good. We don't actually have any history. Right. And so what I, I want to want to write about in the book, what I've been writing about is this forgetting that happens. Yeah. It's sort of this imperial nostalgia that kind of happens, right? right? That, that folks don't want to actually deal with any of this stuff. They just rather forget it. So every time we have a change or a shift or a breakthrough, you know, around race, um, it's like we act like it always is there. Mm -hmm. And it's, the, it's, it's a mode that serves uh, conservatism really well. Mm -hmm. It's a move that serves corporatism really, really well, right. right? It's just like we're living in this eternal present, you know, where there's no history. And, and if we have this relationship to history, it's supposed to be like, oh, it's all good. <laughs> right. We, you know, we're supposed to just live through the trauma yeah. and just be like, 
making it through the trauma. That's just an American way, right? right? right. And that's what I love about your, your essays is that you're like, no, we first chapter of the book. And it's like, I, I didn't expect this from Jeff Chang, right? I don't know, I don't know why, but I just didn't expect you to get so bluesy. Um, and, and actually, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, I just read it as a blues, but when you talk about the words at the end, the, the last sentence says, uh, um, it's something about like, like, word, like words that can change us. And, it, and it's so ideal, right? And I believe it, right? I believe in art, obviously. But I, I, really, I want to ask you, do you really believe that words can change, like us? I think so. Yeah. Um, I do. I really do. Um, all right. I mean, I might come off as, as silly or naive or whatever. I'm naive too, um, but I, I thought you were better than that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I'm stupid. Okay. I'm stupid and naive. Um, and, and you kind of have to be. I mean, like, to get through a lot of this stuff, yeah? I mean, okay, so, um, so yeah, I think that I think that words can free, and I think that you believe that, otherwise you wouldn't be writing. Yeah. Um, and writing so deeply the way that you write. Um, but, I, I mean, like, just to take words, all right? Like, a couple weeks ago, the Associated Press uh, decided that in their style book, they were gonna drop the word illegal in reference mm -hmm. to a human being. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was only going to be used in reference to a system of laws, um, in this case, laws around immigration, right. right? So you could have illegal immigration because you can make a law, and a law determines what's legal and what's illegal. But a person can't be illegal. And this is what folks have been arguing for decades upon decades. And, of course, Rinku Sen and Monica Lavoie from the Drop the Eyewear campaign have been pushing it really, really hard. Um, over the last like two, three years. And I thought that that was huge. Um, because if you look at, if you look at say for instance, what GLAD was doing back in the 80s, um, they were trying to get rid of the term homosexual. Um, and that's because it focused on the language that was about uh, denigration, it was about deviance, right? So the sociology and psychology of deviance. And they wanted to get to a positive space of talking about identity, right? And they were able to be successful with that in 87. And I dare say if they hadn't been successful in 87, we wouldn't have had Ellen DeGeneres mm. coming out, mm. you know, almost 10 years later, right? We wouldn't have had a shift in the debate mm -hmm. um, that we've had around same-sex marriage. It would have been about homosexual marriage. Mm -hmm. Is that even considerable? You know I mean? Like, possible to think about mm -hmm. in that sense? Mm -hmm. So I felt like, you know, we're not gonna necessarily see immediately how the shifting of this, dropping of this word illegal is gonna impact, say, the bill that's in Congress right now, which is equal parts great and equal parts incredibly shitty, right? right? Um, but what we know is, is that we're now in a position to be able to say, okay, you talk about it as illegal, I wanna talk about the human stakes of this, right? Immigrants, people are not illegal. Uh, you can make them illegal. Yeah. So let's have a discussion about that. And I think that that's like an example of how the words can change and words can free. Um, not by itself, obviously. Like, us sitting here and, and talking isn't going to change, you know, the world all by itself, I right. think. But hopefully a little bit of what we're doing and what millions of people are doing. Well, right. so. So, so implicit in that last paragraph of that piece and what you just said is really the idea that words have free. Yeah. And, and so even though the multiculturalist might have won, it, it, it could have been worse. It absolutely, I think. It could have been worse. It could have been worse. Yeah. yeah that's scary. That's pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really scary. Um, I wanted to ask you, can I ask you, like, why did you decide that you wanted to frame this narrative around kids, around teenagers? Uh, in long division? That's a good question. Um, I got my friend Jamal Isawicki here. Went to college with him, and he started a, a, a school, a charter school. He was like 24 years old. And um, I, I was always like, uh, not envious of what Bali did, but you know, I think we had the same education, we talked about a lot of the same things in college. And I, I, I don't know what motivated him, for example, but I, I just always thought, you know, I'm up here at this kind of sort of elite school, trying to make some money so I can, you know, eat good, so my grandma and my mother and everybody else can eat pretty, pretty good too. Uh, but nothing, 
I wasn't getting real, like, I, I could have created art that a younger me and my nephews and nieces would never, ever consume. And so again, like, because I do believe that words matter, I do believe that if we talk about young black kids particularly, I don't believe that they're ever really talked to um, except via hip hop, right? Um, and I think Southern black young kids aren't really hardly ever talked to in literature um, at all. And so I wanted to talk to them while honoring the people who came before me, Octavia Butler, Paul Bay, uh, you know, Morrison, Mark Walker, Alexander. But, but I wanted to talk to them. So, so before I could write the book, I had to go home, I had to do uh, a lot of different, um, have a lot of conversations with younger people. I work with a lot of young folks in Poughkeepsie because you know, the language changes, like I can't have the narrator's talking about how shit is so fresh, you know? <laughs> it's, it's not gonna work. Um, but, 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 but again, the idea was that I, I just wanted to try to write something to people that who aren't normally written to, uh, yeah, they aren't written to, they're spoken to, or they're like, try, you know, people try to convince them to buy shit they shouldn't buy, do shit they shouldn't do, but, but I wanted to, to see if I could talk to them, talk to myself, talk to my grandmother in the same text. So that's why I kind of had to do it time travel. And sort of, I mean, there's kind of really a lot of really interesting intergenerational types of things that are, right. that are happening there. Can you kind of unpack a little bit of what you're trying to trying to do there, as far as the dialogue between parents and kids that are happening? And, and yeah, I, I can unpack. I mean, I'll, I'll be really sure. Well, yeah, it's, it's grandparents. Like, there are not many parents in the book. Um, they're, they're grandparents in the book, and I mean, like, I think again, there's there's a critique I'm making of of uh, parenting actually, and, and this notion of like a traditional family. So, you know, I grew up, grandmothers and grandfathers, particularly grandmothers, were there much more than mothers or fathers. And, and, and I think some literature and some songs and pop culture, I think, shows and explores this, but not enough. And um, again, initially the book was just like, I was exploring the relationship, the psychological relationship, the sexual relationship, the traumatic relationship between grandmothers and grandsons. And that black grandmothers and grandsons. And I think that's something I don't really see a lot of, but most young black men that I knew had some relationship with their grandmother. I'm not saying they all want to fuck their grandmother and they're stupid like that. I mean, I may not be stupid, but whatever. I'm not saying that. Um, but what I am saying is that, I, that the first woman I ever saw Nick was my grandmother. And when I'm talking to some of my boys, they're like, oh, that's the first woman I ever saw Nick too. And like, you know, so what does that, for example, like what does that, what does that mean? And so anyway, I, I, I just think there are a lot of like cultural mores that I heard, shared, digested that I did not see in American Lit. So I wanted to try to bring it to life. Is it like kind of a critique to, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but sort of, of of the civil rights generation too, that there's this like gap, there's this absence of parents yeah. as, as far as there's grandparents, you know, the sort of James Baldwin generation. Right. And the Ralph Ellison generation, and there's the kids, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I'm not gonna say that I think that that is it, but I think that's part of part of it. You know, my my um my grandmother raised her children, her grandchildren, and her great. And she, now she raised her great grandchildren. Um, and, and and there's a there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Like I guess the Buchanans of the world will talk about like the family breakdown, right? The cultural war, family breakdown. But for, 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 for me and for us, I think, a lot of us in Mississippi, um, it, it was a bit more complicated. And it was, it was an attempt on our parents' part to uh, consciously and unconsciously like fuel us with what they felt was tradition, right? I think that's part of what it, like, uh, making this uh, extended, the extended family is all about. And so I just think you can do that in ways other than Medea and, you know, things like that. I'm not knocking this uh, I mean, I'm knocking for the last movie. <laughs> but, but I do think a lot of criticism of him comes from people who don't, don't understand Southern tradition, Southern tradition um, at all. Um, can, can, I, can I ask a question? Sure. <laughs> I could, yeah, please jump in, because otherwise I'm just going to I'm, I'm put you on the spot. I'm, I'm ready. So. Um, and this, and this, is, this, is, this is like super staying question. All right? All right? Like super staying. I wanted to ask you this when you were, uh, when you came, remember when you came to my class and you don't remember coming? <laughs> <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you this. Um, do you still listen? So you were up there and I was like getting all red up here. And stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you but, still listen? Do you still listen to hip hop? Yeah, uh, I have to. Um, uh, 
Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I have to because, because it's part, you know, of, of how I grew up and who I am. Um, and I also have to because I'm a dad and I have a 16-year-old um, as well. So there's a really interesting relationship there. Okay. Um, and I also, you know, I work at Stanford and I work around all of these young folks. And so, uh, so I literally, I'm in my office and I have to listen to Trinidad and James because they, they both been it downstairs, right? Okay. So, uh, so I mean it in all those different types of ways, but I do, I really do. Um, I noticed you were listening to Big Crit when you were writing this. Yeah. Uh, right, that was sort of the person who... I mean, he grew up right down the road from the imaginary place that I'm writing about in that, in that book. Um, <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> um, okay. Um, yeah, but, but, but one, the question I want to ask is that, you know, and I said, this is a super stained question. I mean, are you moved? Like, do you, does any of the music, any of the artists move you the way, I mean, I've heard you talk about Ice Cube, I've heard you talk about Rappers Delight. Like, does yeah. any of the music, does any of the, of the hip hop you hear now move you? And more specifically, more importantly, does any art move you the way that, that music moves you? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, there's sort of the generational thing, right? Like, right. When, you're, when you're 20, and, and you hear, you know, Rizzy Boys in the Hood for the first time and you're scared out of your skull. Right. Like sitting in the room by yourself, listening to this coming up. You know, transmitted from KPO across the bay. And you're in the room and you're, it's dark and Boys in the Hood comes on and you're like, ah, oh my God. Right. That's the scariest thing I ever heard. But it's also the most um, intriguing and, and, and real thing that you ever heard. It, yeah. it, it describes like what's happening on right outside your door, right. you know what I mean? Um, right on the corner where folks are, are selling crap, right right, right down, like when you look out the window. Yeah. Um, and when you look out the back window, you can see the cops beating on, on the on the sellers later in the evening or whatever, you yeah. know? I mean, that's that was real, that was like, wow, you know? Um, and I don't know that, I'll, I mean, I'll ever feel okay. that way again, right? I don't know that I'll ever feel like I'm 24 and I know everything I know there is, I, that there is to know about the world, and then hear Ice Cube and feel like, wow, what just happened here? Right. I have to confront that. Right. Um, so I don't, I don't know that I'll ever feel that way, and I don't try to. You know, I, I, I was, I was at uh, University of Maryland yesterday talking to a lot of younger folks, and I said, look, I'll never feel Trinidad James the way, uh, you know, I'll feel a tribe called Quest, and that's just an age thing, right. most probably. Uh, but then they were saying, oh, we don't feel treated that James either. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. But yeah, you know, so I, I think that that's part of it, you know. But I, I do, I mean, you, you can't help you can't help but be moved. I, I mean, I read your book and I was incredibly, you know, powerfully moved. I think art um, can still do that. I don't think that you lose those, I don't think that you become inured to, you know, the emotions that art music, literature, dance, performance can evoke. Um, and that's what you live for. I mean, it becomes what you live for. If you do get to that point, then um, then, then that's when we really need to intervene, right? Yeah, we need yeah. to really to work on that. And so for me last year, hearing Kendrick Lamar mm. having this conversation mm. with folks my age, mm. right? With Snoop Dogg, mm. with even the game, mm -hmm. who's like, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. five or six years older than you know, and forcing all of these rappers to actually change up their styles mm. and rethink themselves mm. in light of what this, you know, 20-something kid is right. saying, you know, that was powerful to me. And I, sure. I that's what yeah. I, you know, I live for that. I live for the moment that my kid walks in and is like, Dad, that's not, that's, that's whack. Like, listen to this. Mm -hmm. You know, so, yeah. Um, I, so, I, we wanted this to really be a, a conversation with everybody in the room. And so uh, I think we want to open it. But actually, can I ask you one more question? Okay. Just, uh, okay. So no, because I, I think this is really, really deep. Uh, because um, you you were writing about Tupac, um, and you had this quote, and I just want to read this because um, it was it was really powerful to me, and I didn't really know why. Yeah. And I just wanted you to maybe help me through it. Um, you wrote, I didn't know much as a 21-year-old. This is kind of fits what we were just talking about. I didn't know much as a 21-year-old in the fall of 1996, but I knew intimately the ways that black American ambition, that black American ambition, unchecked by healthy doses of fear, would lead to slow, painful deaths. 
and I think this refers to also the essay that you wrote on gun violence, the the you know the the lead piece in the Gawker, which is you know the best thing that the internet has ever produced. Uh, I can't figure out how someone so brilliant, so committed to honest exploration, so willing to fight for us, with us, and against us, could ever live beyond 25 years of age in our United States. say other than I just know that that's true. Uh, uh, I know it's true because I, I've seen um, I've seen desperate people who are unafraid of the, the right things die a lot. And, and I've seen people who are unafraid of the right things kill themselves. I mean, we've all seen it, right? I mean, this is the thing. This is, this is, this is, this is our American life. And um, I, I put that in the essay because, you know, I was I was around, I was dealing with a lot of people who were talking about Tupac and we we're all trying to remember Tupac. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm that age where I can remember, I'm, I'm that age and I'm from a place in the country where I can remember people literally saying, fuck Tupac, he's a wannabe ice cube, right? And so when I say this to young younger people, they, you know, even people who like me, they often want to fight, right? Because Tupac has been, he's a deity now to people. And, and I don't say that to try to, and, 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 and Tupac is crazy inspirational to me, but, but I also say that to say, I, I, I literally remember when, when we thought Tupac, uh, like, I remember literally saying, man, like, he, he just, his voice isn't strong enough. That's crazy to say now, because that's what, you know, that's what he, you know, like, uh, the long ease, right? That's what he's known for, but I remember, like, stacking on the vocals, he was doing this other thing to his vocals, but all that to say, when he got shot, you know, people now, I guess the lore is, oh, we thought he was just going to survive because that's what he did. But I, I was just was surrounded by people who were like, that motherfucker about to die. Because that's what we do. We get shot and we die. And so, you know, there's nothing profound about that. We all know that. But I just think that a lot of the lore around Tupac, and, and, and I appreciate his different perspectives. And I know he got shot nine times before, but for me it was never, oh, he got shot he got shot this time he's gonna live. For a lot of us, it was like, he wilder, he wilder. And, 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 and he's, uh, and, 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 and the, contradic the contradictory part of it is that not only is he wilding, he's too brilliant to be alive. He's too, you know, so I think that the second part of that quote is that, um, you know, there's a, there's a point, I think, in all of our lives when we, uh, you know, you said you have a 16 year old, I don't have any kids, but when I got my job at Vassar, <laughs> And, and I started getting money, and money started coming into my hands and going into some of my family's hands, I couldn't do shit I used to do, right? Like, steal stupid shit. <laughs> Straight for example. <laughs> like, say crazy things to policemen. And, and what I saw in Tupac was like, someone who it appeared just didn't, that didn't happen. And, and I admired it, but I also, it, that has to end violently, particularly for us. And I think this is where money's important in race. I think for some people, and there's a cushion. They can do that shit, and they can fall, they can bounce. And they can do it again, they can fall, they can bounce. They can do it again, they can fall, they can bounce. Tupac was a millionaire. He wasn't about to bounce. So that's how I think race is so important, you know? He's dead for a number of reasons. One of the reasons he's dead because he's a black motherfucker. Like, in that, that's why this post-race narrative shit is important. But, like, let's just look at reality. Millionaires are not falling and bouncing. Black millionaires are falling and dying in hip-hop and other, in other forms. So, anyway... I don't think we're going to talk about that essay, but that's what I thought. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, Actually, cool. I'm not. I'm, 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 I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. But, but, but the maestro, the maestro <laughs> let me know. But I got one more thing, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. All right. And this is really important, especially for those of us who are of Asian American descent in the room. Because one of the things I found really interesting about one of the subplots in Long Division is you have in your night, there's a 1964 thread that's happening. Yeah. And you have a character there whose name is Evan Oshuler, who is uh, a Jewish, am I giving too much away? No, nah, it's like, I, I stole that name from one of my students, I was trying to oh, see yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He told me it was okay, I could use his name, but I was just trying to see if he was here. But he's a really, for me, he was a really, really interesting character. Yeah. Because what happens is, you put him through these crazy paces, it's just right, right, right. unreal what you put him through. Um, but uh, the one thing that he has to do 
over and over again is confront the fact, and your lead character is Sidi, yeah. who is, his real name is Citroen, right? Yeah. So he's citizen, right. French citizen, yeah. um, the, the French word for citizen, yeah. which is powerful in itself. And Shalaya, the two main characters, challenge him constantly on whether he's white or not. Right. Right? You're, you're white, you're white. Oh no, I'm Jewish, I'm Jewish, right? right? Uh, you don't even know I'm Jewish. Right. Like, I can't even tell you right. how it's been for us Jewish folks. Um, and you put him through the paces, and not only him, but his family, yeah. through the paces of, of this particular um, uh, situation of trying to figure out where they stand yeah. within this. And I thought that that was really powerful um, because I think especially for us to that are coming uh, through this immigration reform debate. Yeah. Right? Where, where a lot of times you get what's framed as the good immigrant and the bad immigrant, mm -hmm. right? So, so there's this notion that these immigrants have come in and they'll just actually become white, just like the rest of everybody. Right. Right? Um, that they're hardworking, that they're ambitious, that all they want to do is contribute to American society and that yeah. kind of thing. You don't say I said American, I just said American. American. <laughs> I, didn't even, I didn't even plan to, but just American society. American society. Okay, so, it, it, but yeah, you know, that th this is going on, and I thought that that was really, I was, <laughs> and you could have been thinking about the immigration debate, but you had to have been thinking about um, black folks' relationship to other folks of color when you were writing that. Right. Um, and and the, the ways in which, um, you know, other folks of color can adopt this whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, were you? Yeah, I was definitely thinking about that. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be quick, but one of the things I think if we go back is that uh, initially there's this contest that happens early in the book, and in the contest, the protagonist has a beef with uh, a Mexican American girl, right? And initially, like years ago, when I wrote that, the, the woman was a, it was a South Asian woman and her brother. And, and her brother. And this is when I was I was signed to uh, Penguin, and and my editor was just like, you know, we got we can't we can't run that we can't run that we can't run that, and 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 again at that point you know I was really interested in thinking about Black South Asian relationships uh, dramatically, and and the editor was just like, no, it's not gonna fly, it's not gonna fly. We, you have to you have to do something different, particularly because you're in Mississippi, and you know why not use some other group like Mexicans because there's so many more Mexicans, still have Mexicans. According to her, a lot of Mexicans in Mississippi. So, uh, what I'm saying is, like, I think that's incredible. You picked up a lot of what I was attempting to do in that, and bringing like that 1964 Jewish character into the book was done for a number of reasons. One is that when I went back and I did some research and interviewed some older Jewish people who were involved in the civil rights movement, uh, I met this one family who said that one of the tactics that the Klan used against their family, you know, who knows if it's really true or not, but they said was that the Klan encourage them, parts of their family, to put on masks and go terrorize black bodies. Like this was a form of terror. And, and what they wanted me to understand much more than the bodies they almost or did or did not terrorize was like, think about what that means to feel like you have to go terrorize other folks of color in order to survive. And so, you know, I thought the story was compelling or whatever, so that's why I tried to create Evan Osler based off of that, uh, off of that character. And in my conversation with these, with these Jewish families, the idea of whiteness was like, which is just, it's just rampant, right? Because on one hand, they wanted to be like, you can call me white all you want, but if I was white, that wouldn't have happened to my family. And of course, I'm trying to push back against that in the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, but the last thing I'll say is that there's this point where Evan Oshler, the, black, the Jewish guy, is like, you know, you, you're so mad at me, but what would happen if they came to you to get us? You know what I'm saying? If the Klan was like, we're going to come to y'all, the black community, to go get the Jewish people, what would you do? And the kids are like, bruh, that's never going to fucking happen. That's never going to happen. But then the Jewish guys is like, okay, you know, we imagine though. What would you do? And then, and then, and I don't know if you remember that, but in that, book, in, in that, that moment, both of the characters look at each other and they can't say shit because they know what they would do. You know, so I'm trying to complicate that whole thing. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking a lot about immigration, but also ways that like whiteness is more complicated than definitely, I think. I don't even want to say that. I guess it's true. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I guess. I, <laughs> it's just like in conversations like this, yeah. it's like they always come up. But, well, always come up. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It does, yeah. I love, you know, yeah, I love a lot of white folks.
price. Like, yeah, like, hey, I would come up really with this conversation. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, <laughs> that's, that's true. I guess they do a lot. Should we go to the questions then? So, so I, I, we've been taught, we've been told that that there's a microphone that people who want to ask questions should use, and I and I guess it's going to come around to people. Or there's two microphones. Because you're all being recorded. Oh. Oh, come to the mic. Yes, please come to the mic. Uh, first, I got a shout of praise for both of you. Uh, I'm an educator, and one thing I realized over the years is the, the smarter people get, the more experiences they have, our intellectuals tend to turn their back on the relevant culture. And I follow both of you, and I think it's so important for us to solve these problems if our people that are most articulate uh, are, are committed to being relevant and fighting the same fights and listening to the voices of the folks that are going through things. Um, I have a question for, for both of you, but more towards Kese, because you got two books coming out. Uh, and this is about your tools as a writer. And you got one book of nonfiction essays, and you have a fiction book coming out. And I'm just wondering, as a writer, as someone who believes in the power of words, as you explore issues of race and culture, do you find that you can probe those issues and ask certain questions depending on which writing style you, you choose? That's a great question. Jabali. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I believe that the questions that I'm exploring in um, How to Slowly Kill Yourselves and Others are questions that I, I could not effectively explore. And, and again, most importantly, what I wanted to do in that book, and maybe hopefully y'all will buy it, is I wanted to get my mother. Buy it. Just I wanted, buy it. I wanted to get my mother, my aunt, a few of my friends in there, not just talking to me, but talking to uh, each other. Um, and, and I could do that figuratively, but it, but it literally would not be their voices, you know? And, and I want to say figuratively, I do do that. You know, I am like channeling some of the spirit of my grandmother, my aunts, and all these other people and characters I create. But also just thought, uh, for a number of reasons. One, the book, yeah, I think a number of reasons I wanted that book to in some way be organized the way like the best art of the last 20, 30, 40 years has been. For me, the best art has kind of been music. And, and, and I think, you know, we've all heard lots of terrible hip-hop and rap songs with lots of and albums, but the great albums, I think, find ways to pull off the crew song. You know, the song was like three or four MCs going back and forth, and I wanted to try to do that through literature. So there's, a, there's, this, one, there's this one piece where there's five, five black men, um, one from New York, one from Mississippi, one transgender, one who just got out of the pen, and we're all writing letters to one another. In the beginning, the half, the half of the essay I just read, the first half is for me, the second half is my, my aunt talking to my Uncle Jimmy from her point of view. The last essay in the book is my mother writing an essay, writing a letter to me, and my writing back to her, and then in the middle is another piece of my aunt. And so, all that to say, yeah, like genre matters, and I, I could not have done what I wanted to do in fiction. I think that's a really good question. Yeah. Um, just briefly, I was wondering if you could explain more what you mean by New York City has forgiven LL? No, no, listen. <laughs> Let's listen. I watch World Star. I know New York is I'm trying to get home tonight. I mean, real talk. I mean, I have an inferiority complex about New York City, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and the inferiority, inferiority complex is because, you know, I, I feel like where I'm from created the most important shit ever, right? I feel like the blues and gospel is the most important stuff ever. I feel like we don't get enough credit. Y'all created this other art form that I love, and y'all get all the credit for it, blah, blah, blah. Y'all think we slow and all this other kind of stuff. <laughs> but my point is not that New York, that my, my point is like, how did, how, did, how, did New, how did LL think that it would be okay as a New Yorker to write that song? And maybe it's just Southern black mentality, because again, what I'm trying to say is the worst rappers, the most fucked up rappers, the most ignorant rappers, the most vapid rappers, if they would have gotten Brad Paisley's lyrics, they would not have been able to write that song and come back home. They would have had to, as y'all say, represent. And I'm just wondering where representation went when it came to his lyrics. It had really nothing to do, it's not a diss in New York City, it has more to probably do with like LL and Maybe he's not feeling like he's a New Yorker anymore. So beyond race, I'm trying to think about the way geography works. 
So a lot of these rappers, and we all know, you know, we use words to destroy and just detonate women's bodies. That's what all of the rappers do. But one of the beautiful things about rap is that X, when it does confront white supremacy, it confronts white supremacy. We expect more truth from rappers than we do politicians. I expect more truth from rappers than I do my colleagues, partially because we're talking to one another. And, and that may be the answer to this question. LL, I guess, felt like he was talking to Paisley and his audience, so maybe he thought that's why he could do that. I don't know. But whatever the case is, I just think it's interesting that in that situation, I'm, I don't think the worst Southern rapper on earth would have written something so foolish, ahistorical, and, and, and potentially dangerous. I don't like to think it's dangerous because I don't think people really care about that song. But it's potentially dangerous to say to white supremacy, I'm gonna make a deal with you. If I do this, history don't matter. Mm -hmm. Potentially that's dangerous, and it's dangerous in public policy, and it's dangerous in, in, in words. And I just think, I think, you know, if y'all don't feel like LL dis, you know, like misrepresented you as New Yorkers, I think you should feel that way. Because if we, if, he, if that shit came out of Big Crit, David Banner's mouth, which would never, <laughs> like we would, we would have some words for him. You know, he wouldn't be able to just come back and just, oh, sorry y'all, no. <laughs> Not to white supremacy. Um, I wanted to thank both y'all uh, for coming out here. Um, I wanted to maybe build on the uh, topic that you were talking about right before the Q and A. Um, so I think Jeff earlier you said that like what America needs right now is a really brutally honest conversation on race, right? And I think the subtext of that is we need a conversation between people of color and white people. Uh, but I was kind of wondering um, if the dynamics of that change when it's between a person of color and another person of color, right? Um, I'm kind of thinking about like after 92, the Rodney King riots, right? Uh, a lot of tension between the uh, black community and the Korean Americans in LA. Um, you know, and, and you know, there can be a lot of tension between uh, different uh, communities, uh, minority communities, right? So I was wondering, uh, you know, have to do the parameters change when it's between a person of color and another person of color and how the conversation shifts? Thank you. Thanks. That's an awesome question. And I think that um, I think that it does shift. I think the parameters shift uh, uh, a lot. Um, and it used to be this thing, I think, so the, the conceit of multiculturalism was sort of that if we were able to get all our stories out, because at that point, it was like, everybody's in the same boat together, right? We're all under, underrepresented. We're not getting any kind of representation at all. There's an absence of representation. There's the presence of misrepresentation for all of us. So multiculturalism is everybody kind of getting in this boat and saying we're all sailing onto shore and we're gonna you know, go and storm the city or that kind of thing, whatever. I'm, I'm mixing all my metaphors up. Um, but, but what was interesting and clear is that multiculturalism as an arts movement um, really collapsed um, around 92, 93, 94. Um, partly because of the first multicultural riots, right? The Los Angeles riots in 1992. Um, and then you had a huge backlash that was coming um, right here in New York City. A lot of establishment critics um, were pushing back against all the work that was being done in identity. And if you get a chance to see, I haven't seen it yet, I'm gonna try to go tomorrow um, or on Saturday, but the 1993 show, we had a lot of folks who I know um, who are in it. Uh, the 1993 exhibition at the New Museum tries to actually capture this moment before the critics really push back. Mm. And so, you know, for instance, this year we're looking at trying to do an event around how people do race and identity in contemporary visual art. And a lot of artists of color, like, were just very on edge. They didn't want to do it because it meant that they would have to come out politically, publicly, and they might get pinned, right. you know, as, oh, that's the artist that does race. Um, so the discussion that happened 20 years ago is, is, has been silenced, and it's still that way, and I think that's indicative of, of the larger conversation around race that's happening. Um, you mentioned earlier, too, now, that Obama has to talk about race in certain kinds of ways. Ta-Nehisi Coates um, has written really, really well about this, Hua has written um, about this as well, you know, um, whiteness is a different kind of thing now, and and Obama has to play himself in relationship to that whiteness in a much different kind of way, um, and that is is unbelievably frustrating. And so, 
you get the onion that used to be really, really good on race, yeah. doing the crazy stuff that they did around the convention day Wallace, right? So, so that conversation has to, by all means, happen. And I feel like that we're, in some ways, at the beginning of this again. Um, it's almost like every generation has to recreate the, the race conversation, mm -hmm. you know, and pick it, up, pick it up where the previous generation uh, got either, uh, they either dropped the ball or it, it, it got, you know, it, it, it got swallowed up and they were repressed, um, like in the case of visual art. Um, and the but the, but the thing that I'm optimistic about is that the conversations between races, mm -hmm. between folks of color, has advanced a lot uh, since since 1992. Um, I see it in the community organizing world, and I see it in the arts making world. Those folks who are working around race and identity, I think, have been able to build a uh, new language together. Maybe again, maybe I'm just glass half full, more optimistic, naive, and stupid. Um, but I think that that's uh, happened quite a bit, you know, so that you see, in a lot of respects, uh, folks who are working uh, not in this sort of uh, essential, essentialist kind of way around identity, but folks taking leadership and looking at the ways in which different things come together. And I'm thinking, for instance, of people like organizers like Ai Jin Pu, right, who organizes domestic workers. Um, uh, you know, she was one of the folks who came out of the same generation that we did um, and took a lot of uh, the shock and the trauma of the riots uh, to heart and now is doing amazing multiracial uh, organizing around domestic workers. Um, and, you know, with Culture Strike, I think that we've been trying to do that as well. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work around immigration. And, uh, and it's very important for us to be able to see how this impacts everybody um, in a lot of different types of ways. And, and, uh, and so, I'm optimistic in that sense. I think that the conversation has moved forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have the tools to be able to move these conversations forward. What's lacking is, in some ways, a national will uh, to be able to do that. Um, and, uh, and we have to pull, create spaces to do it. But here's the stakes. The stakes are that Whatever this amorphous group is that elected Obama to office in 2008, and then came back in 2012 and elected him again, um, whatever this amorphous group is, could be a new majority, a new cultural majority, right? Like, we're not at a point anymore where we're all minorities. Right. Together we can form a cultural majority. And my question is, what is that majority gonna stand for? You know, what are the values that we're gonna stand for What's our, our, our uh, what's the culture that we're going to be advancing, uh, be pushing towards? What are the visions that we're that we're going to be putting out into the world? Because ultimately, right, if we're trying to, okay, I'm rambling, right? But I just want to say this: um, the right only needs to say that we need to restore things, right. right? They can just harken back to this past that was much so much better back then, right? Which of course it wasn't. Right? Um, but they could just say, oh, this is how Pat Buchanan begins his book. He says, you know, whatever happened to the America that we all grew up in? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what America did you grow up in? Right. I can tell about the America I grew up in. Yeah. Um, but that's, his, that's how he starts it, right? So it's this imperial nostalgia, right? Um, but progressives, we always have to push a new vision. We have to push something new out there. We have to make people believe in things that haven't been seen yet, right? Belief open the things that are unseen, right? Um, we have to, like, hear a world that hasn't been, like, heard yet. We have to tell a world that hasn't been told yet, you know? So, so we are, are, our burden, our special burden is that we have to pull people forward into something that they haven't necessarily imagined yet. And that's, I think, our job. I think that's the job of all of you who are 20 years old in here over the next, over your lifetimes. So there you go, now you have your job. And this is again a, a really uh, stupid question, but those are sometimes the best questions. Uh, is it possible for this younger generation or, or us or whatever to pull ourselves and the nation into you know this kind of healthy counter movement if we 
soulfully, spiritually, are unhealthy. Like, I'm really interested in thinking about like what political movement has to do with it, with the, co the the collective, but also the individual. Like, if we like, how important is it for us to be healthy if we're going to create healthy movement? Yeah, I think it's really, really crucial. I think it's central to it. I mean, we're sort of, you know, the generation that is about self care. Yeah. I don't think it was a word back then, right? right? Um, and and sort of uh, we're also the generation that that recognizes the healing. I know it's deep in your writing, um, in your book of essays, as well as in Long Division. Um, and, and I mean, it's all there in the Gawker essay, right? Um, this, this notion of, of folks who are pulling guns are just as broken um, as, as the folks who are, uh, you know, on the other side of the gun, as, as, as uh, Kendrick Lamar would say. Gentlemen. Um, so. You have three ladies waiting to ask you questions. I'm sorry. So, anyway, love us a lot. Yeah, I think it's important. Just saying. Sorry, my man. No, no, no. Just correct this. No, no. I'm one, I'm, I was thinking from before, it had a lot to do with what you were talking about uh, recently, uh, right now, about whiteness. And something that really freaked me out was watching the freak out in November when folks were, you know, the white establishment is no longer a majority and all of that, you know. Uh, and thinking at uh, the fact, like you were saying, that Jewish people were no, not white before, and neither were Italians, and neither were Irish, and neither were Greeks, etc., etc., etc. So that in a way, whiteness has remained a majority by continually absorbing others into that whiteness so that it becomes and continues to have that status. So the thing that makes me nervous um, is white Latinos. Are we next? Is this it? Is this the is this the seduction of whiteness that is going to come and say, no, you too, come, come, wear the little thing, you know? And, um, and in our own countries, a lot of times that is already the case, right? The whiteness is there, and it operates in that racist way. And so, when you guys were talking right now around solidarity and around that future and that hope, in what are we going to stand for? I would really caution and warn uh, any, like you know easily identifiable or co-opted as white people of color, that perhaps we were not, and I'm speaking here for myself and others, that in our own countries might not have been thinking of ourselves as people of color, because we were all Puerto Rican, whatever, you know, right. that we're all, it, then it's jumping the puddle that then you get in solidarity with a bunch of other people that are people of color, and that has been so valuable. And I really uh, hope that the seduction of whiteness isn't such that then we are co-opted into that and forget all about the beauty of what we've been able to do together. So that's is it seductive? Can I, ask, can I throw a yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. Is it seductive? I think that in terms of power, I don't think it's not seductive for, for me. you. Yeah, okay. It is not seductive for me. Okay. But I do think that in terms of power, uh, there is a sense in which it still functions in a certain way. That uh, in the same way that in a lot of ways, maleness, right? You know, masculinity still functions in a certain way. So just to be careful, you know, to surf that that little wave there with caution, uh, because it's really old, you know, it's really old that it that that is power. And so we, in part of this rewriting, is rewriting our own position as people of color and redefining that so that we don't fall prey to the like, okay, now you too, come on. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just wanted to throw that out. Thank you. Words like savvy and stuff are really important. Savvy, uh, all of that. But I, I think you tell the truth, and, and and I think you reckon with the truth. And and if you're in front of a, uh, an audience of folks who you think you need to lie to, 
you probably should tell that audience the truth. That's, that, I mean, that, that's, that's what I've learned in, in, in my little short time on Earth. And we could talk about that, but, uh, you know, grandma would say, lying never, never really ends up helping you. And, and, and so my problem with LL Cool J, and I don't know why I keep talking about it, but I just think he lied. And I think he lied because he felt like he needed to lie to those people. But we've seen over and over again, like, lying to those people, it, like, what happens? Like, lying to a, a, a white, rural country audience, for what? And, and then trying to fool the rest of us and be like, well, now the dialogue has started. Now you got a lot of us, too. You see what I'm saying? It's like literally what happens in real life. You lie, you have to lie again. You lie. And so now LL is going all over, the, all over the country lying to us. Even though you heard me say that, what I really said was, motherfucker, that's a lie. <laughs> we heard what you said. So I just, think, I just think we have to be willing to excavate and reckon with the truth no matter where the audiences are. And, and, and then the harder part is, is, is changing based on that truth that we excavate, right? Like how do we, how do we change in the way we live our lives, change public policy based on the truth? But we can't even get there because we like, are, are like literally obsessed with lying. I am, and maybe you are, but a lot of us are obsessed with it. And so I just think anytime we can tell the truth, we really have to try to push ourselves to tell the truth. That's my lame answer, what, what you got? No, but, uh, I can't talk that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. So we've talked a little bit about race and hip hop, and I'm wondering what you both have to say about the intersection of the two, and when there's groups like That's Racist, or I don't know if you've heard of the Blue Scholars, when they bear this burden of, say, um, representation, like she had said before, um, and they don't necessarily want to be restricted in that box, what do you think is the takeaway for people of different ethnicities? When they're talking about these issues of race, do you think there's a different message being conveyed to people, um, to South Asians or Filipino community and then the white community? Do you think there's a different takeaway? Um, I think that one's for me. Um, I, you know, it's, so, the, so those of you who have heard me speak before, I've probably heard this story before, um, but every time uh, I went out for about five, six, even now, five, six years around Can't Stop, Won't Stop, the number one question I would get would be, what's a Chinese Hawaiian guy doing writing about hip hop, <laughs> right? It was just a, it was, folks just didn't get it. It used to get me really mad. Um, and. And I've finally, I think, now reconciled myself uh, and, 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 and sort of understand fully, you know, kind of what's going on and overstand, I guess, in the Zulu Nation, I overstand it now. Um, so, on the one hand, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the notion that hip hop is a black thing, which it is. It could not have begun as anything but a black thing in the place that it began in, with all of these different types of Afro-diasporic cultures and Afro-Caribbean and Afro-Latino uh, folks interacting with African-Americans in this space to produce what became hip-hop. It's just factual, right? It's just factual. Um, so that's absolutely what's up. But on the other hand, like, I'm a hip-hop cliche, <laughs> yeah. right? I, I grew up, you know, with Rapper's Delight. Yeah. I, I, you know, I dress uh, in, in bright colors when Native Tongues came along, right? I, uh, I was, you know, at the clubs trying to, you know, wave my glass when, you know, when Diddy and them were doing their thing. I just, I did it all, right? I just like, I'm a cliche, right? I'm a hip-hop cliche. Um, Geo and Blue Scholars, they're hip-hop cliches, right? Heems, That's Racist, are they still together? Um, they're not, right? So sad, so sad. But, they're, you know, they're hip-hop cliches as well. They tell you that, I think, too. You know, we're all hip-hop cliches. We're all hip-hop. The gift, the gift that Afro-diasporic cultures gave to the world through hip-hop was the gift to be able to express the specificity of your stories. Um, and I think that that's uh, something that needs to be recognized, understood, um, respected. And that's the beginning of communication, really. That's the beginning of where we can start having these conversations, these real conversations that kind of need to be able to take place um, that will pull us forward to where, where we want to go, right? Uh, away from this monoculture of whiteness 
you know, towards the radical idea that the multiculturalists espouse, which is a sort of radical diversity. And, so. and I just think we also have to be allow ourselves, um, we have to allow words and people to obliterate cliché. So we're all cliché, for example. Um, if we look at uh, what happened with Rick Ross, um, a lot of Yurik that 20 years ago, nobody would have thought was really that offensive. You know, back in the heyday, when everybody talks about how rap used to be so political, it was bullshit, right? It could have been political, but women were not shit. Women weren't shit. So what we have to, I think, also do is allow like that cliche and phrases. So, so Kiss, who's your favorite rapper? I want to say Jay or Biggie or some other person who's like really great with words on one hand and not allow the fact that these also are men who have like completely dismantled women's bodies lyrically to matter. So to burst the cliche, I need to think about how actually if, you're, if they're going to do that, what am I doing by saying like these are my favorite MCs? Do you see what I'm saying? I, I just think that the work that people have done needs to obliterate the cliche. And I've just been thinking about this a lot lately, how particularly around women's bodies for the last 20 years, we, we, we aren't bursting the cliche. And I know one way I can burst the cliche is when some silly kid who looks up to me is like, so who's your favorite rapper? Like, I can't say J. I can't say M. I can't say Nas. Because if I do say that, and Lord forbid there's a woman asking me that, what I'm saying is my favorite rapper is somebody who thinks you ain't shit which really means I must really think you ain't shit. So if I'm going to say it, I need to be honest and be like, well, my favorite rapper is him. I don't think you shit. My favorite rapper is Nas. I don't think you shit, right? And, and, and I was just saying, like, I think that like, the, the work is being done to burst these cliches, which really means like rupture, rupture, rupture uh, narrative momentum, like to change. The work is being done. The question is, are we accepting it? Are we manifesting it in real ways? in the way we live our lives, and then in the movements that we, that we actually put out there. And, and I think it's hard work, but I know I'm not doing it. Okay, I think this is the last question right here. I think we're about to run out of time. Oh, that's it? I'm sorry. I think that was the last question, <laughs> and we have run out of time. Um, did you, well, just, just, just to say uh, thank you very much for allowing us to be here. Um, and have this conversation in front of you all, with you all. Um, buy his books, <laughs> June and August, Long Division, How to Die Slowly, in a, uh, How to Kill Yourself and Others in Slowly in a... Right. In a <laughs> <laughs> Good your title. That one. <laughs> buy his books again, <laughs> and buy who we be when it comes out, and um, thank y'all so much for being thank so generous. You.